Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Noah Warren, the coordinator of Lunch Poems. Uh, first, thank you all for being here today, and thank you, Jerrica, for joining us. Um, just a few notes before I hand it over to Jeffrey G. O'Brien, our uh, director. Um, if you're interested, please sign up. There's an email list over by the desk, and feel free to take a poster. Um, you can also, if you're interested in the rest of this year's events, go to lunchpoems.berkeley.edu. And if you want to view this reading or any past readings, I invite you to go to YouTube, uh, where we have a Lunch Poems channel. I'd like to thank the university libraries and the Morrison Library for their generous support. And I'd like to thank uh, Owen and Noah from Moe's for being here and selling books. Thanks, guys. Um, before we begin, I'd like you to please silence your phones um, and join us at our next event here on November 7th, where we'll, where we'll have the privilege of hearing Monica Yoon. Later in the year, on December 5th, we'll hear Margaret Ross. And now, please welcome our director, Jeffrey G. O'Brien, who will introduce Jericho Brown. Thank you. Thank you, Noah. Thank you all for being here, and welcome, Jericho. Um, I'd love to talk for the next 40 minutes about what's going on inside this book, but I'd rather hear about it from Jericho and from the book. So I will be brief. Um, I wanted to talk briefly, though, about the fact that Jericho has invented a form that actually is not a gimmick. It's a real, live, contemporary, functional form called the duplex. Of course, what invention means in poetry is really the repurposing, the recombination of extant forms from the tradition, right? Which happens conveniently to be the name of the book. Right? So Jericho describes the duplex as being a kind of um, beautiful Frankensteining of the sonnet, the guzzle, and the blues tradition that keeps sort of mutating either a full line or half of a line or the n-words of a line as it proceeds across couplets of nine to 11 syllables down to its 14th line. Um, the reason why I want to talk about the duplex as a kind of metonymy for what's going on in the book in general is precisely because it um, acknowledges that there is no the tradition. There are only traditions, a tradition. Um, that's what the canon wars of the 80s were all about. Um, the duplex is interesting in Jericho's hands, even though it also seems to me, especially in one of its most famous ones, which is on the back, I begin with love hoping to end there, which ends, I grow green with hope, I'd like to end there. <laughs> Referencing to me East Coker by T.S. Eliot, in my end is my beginning, in my beginning is my end. Um, because Jericho's not contending with the same history and contemporary moment of experience that T.S. Eliot was, right? There's a way in which we can think of this, the sheer formal innovation at work in the duplex as also having incredibly painful and beautiful payoffs in terms of political fury and an interest in justice and interest in eros and other kinds of collective love. Um, to talk about beginnings and endings as an African-American man is to think about the legacy of slavery still informing every moment of walking in America, thinking in America, reading and singing in America. There's no way to avoid, therefore, political and social ramifications of what otherwise might simply be poetic structure or form, except poetic structure or form is never simply about itself. It's always suffused with specific and general histories, as this is. At the same time, it would be a real um, coarsening and a real form of parsimony to map what Jericho does with form only to political experience. We can say that that experience helps drive poetic innovation, or that poetic innovation, once it happens, collects some of the other features of experience to it, like iron filings to a magnet. We don't have to choose in the same way we don't have to choose a tradition and make it the tradition. We get to hear all of that complication without resolving it, and that's what we are about to do. Welcome, Jericho. What a great introduction. Did y'all hear all those nice things he said about me? <laughs> y'all should try that. And you should publish that. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Noah. Thank you, Jeffrey G. O'Brien. Thank you, Mose, for being here. And thank you to everyone for coming. Prayer of the backhanded. Not the palm, not the pear tree switch, not the broomstick, nor the closest extension cord, not 
his braided belt, but God bless the back of my daddy's hand, which holding nothing tightly against me and not wrapped in leather, eliminated the air between itself and my cheek. Make full this dimpled cheek unworthy of its unfisted print and forgive my forgetting the love of a hand hungry for reflex, a hand that took no thought of its target like hail from a blind sky, involuntary, fast, but brutal in its bruising. Father, I bear the bridge of what might have been a broken nose. I lift to you what was a busted lip, Bless the boy who believes his best beatings lack intention, the mark of the beast. Bring back to life the son who glories in the sin of immediacy, calling it love. God, save the man whose arm, like an angel's invisible wing, may fly backward in fury whether or not his son stands near Help me hold in place my blazing jaw as I think to say, excuse me. As a human being, there is the happiness you have and the happiness you deserve. They sit apart from each other the way you and your mother sat on opposite ends of the sofa after an ambulance came to take your father away. Some good doctor will stitch him up and soon an aunt will arrive to drive your mother to the hospital where she will settle next to him forever as promised. She holds the arm of her seat as if she could fall, as if it is the only sturdy thing. And it is, since you've done what you've always wanted. You fought your father and won, marred him. He'll have a scar he can see, all because of you and your mother, the only woman you ever cried for must tend to it as a bride tends to her vows, forsaking all others, no matter how sore the injury. No matter how sore the injury has left you, you sit understanding yourself as a human being, finally free now that nobody's got to love you. Uh, much of my work makes use of words and phrases uh, that I heard when I was a kid. Um, I grew up in Shreveport, Louisiana, and I moved from there to New Orleans, Louisiana, and I moved from there to Houston, Texas. So I spent most of my adult life in the American South. I, lived in, I live in Atlanta, Georgia now. When I left Houston, Texas, though, and before Atlanta, I lived in San Diego, California, which is where I found out I have an accent. <laughs> So one of, those, um, one of those words or phrases that I heard when I was a kid that I found out in San Diego is not actually a word, is the word nim. And that word means that person and everyone you would associate with that person. In a sentence or in context, um, if you see someone that you haven't seen in a very long time, uh, but when you did see them before, you knew them and you knew their family, uh, if you see them again, you might say something like, Hey, how you doing? How's your mother? And them. So that's how that word works. And that's the title of this next poem. And them. They said to say goodnight and not goodbye. Unplugged the TV when it rained. They hid money in mattresses. So to sleep on decisions. Some of their children were not their children. Some of their parents had no birth dates. They could sweat a cold out of you. They'd wake without an alarm telling them to. Even the short ones reached certain shelves. Even the skinny cooked animals too quick to catch. And I don't care how ugly one of them arrived. That one got married to somebody fine. 
They fed families with change and wiped their kitchens clean. Then another century came. People like me forgot their names. Bullet points. I will not shoot myself in the head and I will not shoot myself in the back and I will not hang myself with a trash bag. And if I do, I promise you, I will not do it in a police car while handcuffed or in the jail cell of a town I only know the name of because I have to drive through it to get home. Yes, I may be at risk, but I promise you, I trust the maggots who live beneath the floorboards of my house to do what they must to any carcass more than I trust an officer of the law of the land to shut my eyes like a man of God might or to cover me with a sheet so clean my mother could have used it to tuck me in when I kill me I will do it the same way most Americans do I promise you cigarette smoke or a piece of meat on which I choke, or so broke I freeze in one of these winters we keep calling worst. I promise if you hear of me dead anywhere near a cop, then that cop killed me. He took me from us and left my body, which is, no matter what we've been taught, greater than the settlement a city can pay a mother to stop crying and more beautiful than the new bullet fished from the folds of my brain. From the King James Version of the Bible, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Romans 12 and one. I will begin with the body in the year of our Lord, porous and wet, love racked and willing. In my 23rd year, a certain obsession overtook my body, or I should say, I let a man touch me until I bled, until my blood met his hunger and so was changed, was given a new name, as is the practice among my people who are several and whole, holy and acceptable. On the whole, hurt by me, they will not call me brother. Hear me coming, and they cross their legs, as men are wont to hate women, as women are taught to hate themselves. They hate a woman they smell in me. Every muscle of her body clenched in fits beneath men heavy as heaven. My body, dear, dying, sacrifice, desirous as I will be, black as I am. Ganymede, a man trades his son for horses. That's the version I prefer. I like the safety of it. No one at fault, everyone rewarded. God gets the boy. The boy becomes immortal. His father rides until grief sounds as good as the gallop of an animal born to carry those who patrol our inherited kingdom. When we look at myth this way, nobody bothers saying rape. I mean, don't you want God to want you? Don't you dream of someone with wings taking you up? And when the master comes for our children, he smells like the men who own stables in heaven, that far terrain between promise and apology. No one has to convince us. The people of my country believe we can't be hurt if we can be bought. Romans 12 and 1. 
riddle. We do not recognize the body of Emmett Till. We do not know the boy's name nor the sound of his mother wailing. We have never heard a mother wailing. We do not know the history of this nation in ourselves. We do not know the history of ourselves on this planet because we do not have to know what we believe we own. We believe we own your bodies, but have no use for your tears. We destroy the body that refuses use. We use maps we did not draw. We use a sea. We see a sea, so cross it. We see a moon, so land there. We love land so long as we can take it. Shh, we can't take that sound. What is a mother wailing? We do not recognize music until we can sell it. We sell what cannot be bought. We buy silence. Let us help you. How much does it cost to hold your breath underwater? Wait, wait, what are we? What, what on earth are we? What? Crossing. The water is one thing and one thing for miles. The water is one thing making this bridge built over the water another. Walk it early. Walk it back when the day goes dim. Everyone rising just to find a way toward rest again. We work. Start on one side of the day like a planet's only sun. Our eyes straight until the flame sinks. The flame sinks. Thank God. I'm different. I figured and counted. I'm not crossing to cross back. I'm set on something vast. It reaches long as the sea. I'm more than a conqueror, bigger than bravery. I don't march. I'm the one who leaps. Trojan, when a hurricane sends winds far enough north to put our power out, we only think of winning the war bodies wage to prove the border between them isn't real. An act of God so sweet, no TV, no novel, no recreation but each other, and neither of us willing to kill. I don't care, I don't love my lover. Knowing where to stroke in little light, knowing what will happen to me and how soon. These rank higher than a clear view of the face I'd otherwise flay had I some training in combat. A blade, a few matches, Candles are romantic because we understand shadows. We recognize the shape of what once made us come. So we come thinking of approach in ways that forego substance. I'm breathing, heaving now in my own skin, and I know it. Romance is an act. The perimeter stays intact. We make out so little that I can't help but imagine my safety. I get to tell the truth about what kind of person lives and who dies. Barefoot survivors, damned heroes, each corpse lit on a pyre. Patroclus died because he could not see what he really was inside his lover's armor. The Ten Commandments. But I could be covetous. I could be a thief. Could want and work for. Could wire and deceive. I thought to fool the moon into a doubt. I did some doubting. Lord, forgive me. In New Orleans that winter, I waited for a woman to find me shirtless on her back porch. Why? 
She meant it rhetorically and hit me with open hands. How many times can a woman say why with her hands in the moonlight? I counted ten like light breaking hard on my head, ten rhetorical whys and half a moon, half nude, I let her light into me. I could be last on a list of lovers Joe Adams would see and first to find his wife slapping the spit out of me. I could be sick and sullen. I could sulk and sigh. I could be a novel character by E. Lynn Harris, but even he'd allow me some dignity. He loved black people too much to write about a wife whipping her rival on a night people in Louisiana call cold. He'd have Joe Adams run out back and pull her off of me. He wouldn't think I deserved it. Track one, Lush Life. The woman with the microphone sings to hurt you, to see you shake your head. The mic may as well be a leather belt. You drive to the center of town to be whipped by a woman's voice. You can't tell the difference between a leather belt and a lover's tongue. A lover's tongue might call you bitch, a term of endearment where you come from, a kind of compliment preceded by the word sing in certain nightclubs, a lush little tongue you have. You can yell, sang bitch, and I love you with a shot of Patron at the end of each phrase from the same bar stool every Saturday night, but you can't remember your father's leather belt without shaking your head. That's what satisfies her, the woman with the microphone. She does not mean to entertain you, and neither do I. Speak to me in a lover's tongue. Call me your bitch, and I'll sing the whole night long. Another elegy. This is what your dying looks like. You believe in the sun. I believe I can't love you. Always be closing, said our favorite professor before he let the gun go off in his mouth. I turned 29 the way any man turns in his sleep, unaware of the earth moving beneath him, its plates in their places, a dated disagreement. Let's fight it out, baby. You have only so long left a man turning in his sleep. So I take a picture. I won't look at it, of course. It's his bad side, his Mr. Hyde, the hole in a husband's head, the O oh of his wife's mouth. Every night I take a pill, miss one, and I'm gone. Miss two, and we're through. Hotels bore me unless I get a mountain view a room in which my cell won't work and there's nothing to do but see the sun go down into the ground that cradles us as any coffin can. Duplex. I begin with love hoping to end there. I don't want to leave a messy corpse. I don't want to leave a messy corpse full of medicines that turn in the sun. Some of my medicines turn in the sun. Some of us don't need hell to be good. Those who need most need hell to be good. What are the symptoms of your sickness? Here is one symptom of my sickness. Men who love me are men who miss me. Men who leave me are men who miss me. In the dream where I am an island. In the dream where I am an island, I grow green with hope. I'd like to end there. 
Thank you all so much.